In the early 2010s, Luke Donald stepped up his game and became the number one player in the world. He seemed to be in prime position to make a lasting mark in the game and win a major championship. However, in the latter part of this decade, he has been passed by his competition and his game has plateaued. Greetings y'all, it's your knock Peter Mata and today we're going to talk about what happened to Luke Donald. Son to Anne and Colin Donald, Luke was born in the cozy town of Hemel Hempstead in Hertfordshire, England. When he was a young lad, Luke's parents bought a timeshare package in Lamunga, Spain that included free golf. This gave Luke and his brothers a place to play and enjoy the game during the summers as they grew up. And from there, Luke's love and skill for golf quickly blossomed. As he grew older in England, Luke played at Beaconsfield Golf Club where he was twice the club champion at the ages of 15 and 16. Along with that and other successes in junior golf, Luke was hopeful that it could translate to the college level in the United States. Thus, he joined the College Prospects of America, which created a resume for him and sent it to all the major colleges and universities in the US. Several coaches responded. One particular that showed great interest was Wally Goodwin at Sanford University who at the time had a young man named Tiger Woods on the team. While Luke didn't receive an offer from Stanford, Wally did recommend him to his previous school, Northwestern University in Chicago. There, Luke and the golf coach Pat Goss formed a wonderful working relationship. In 1999, Luke won the NCAA Individual Championship, where he beat the scoring record that was formerly held by Tiger. He won a dozen other times and broke many other school records. He also became the first amateur to win the Chicago Open in 2000. With such tremendous success in college, Luke naturally began setting his sights on a pro career. In 2001, he turned professional and received the max allowed of seven sponsor exemptions into PGA Tour events. He wasn't able to earn his card that way, but he was able to get through all three stages of Q School successfully during the fall and earn his tour card for 2002. In 2002, he was fairly consistent as he made cuts and racked up several top 25 finishes. In the last tournament of the year, he picked up his first PGA Tour win at the Southern Farm Bureau Classic. The tournament was cut down to 54 holes because of weather, but still, this capped off an amazing first year on tour for Luke. From 2003 to 2005, he had solid seasons on the PGA Tour. He didn't have any individual victories, but he had a few high finishes in premier events. For instance, he was involved in the playoff in John Daly's last PGA Tour win at the 2004 Buick Invitational, and in 2005 he finished runner-up by one at the Players, and he also finished tied third in his Masters debut. During this time, Luke also began establishing a successful footing on the European Tour. In 2004, he won two events by five shots. With that and more good play, it earned him enough credibility for Bernhard Langer to use a captain's pick on him for that year's Ryder Cup. In his debut there, Luke posted a 2-1-1 record that helped Team Europe win that event. Moving forward to 2006 and 2007, Luke continued his good play. In the beginning of 2006, he picked up his second PGA Tour win at the Honda Classic. In both the PGA Tour and European Tour during this time, he had steady play where he racked up several top 10s and top 25 finishes. He also had a great showing in the 2006 PGA Championship. There, Luke returned to his adopted hometown of Chicago and played beautifully. He was even tied for the lead with Tiger going into the final round. While Tiger ultimately won that major, Luke's tied for third showed that his game was ready for prime time. He again made the Ryder Cup that year and posted a wonderful record of 3-0-0 and again helped Team Europe prevail in that Ryder Cup. In 2008, while Luke was having another solid season on tour, he unfortunately got a wrist injury in that year's U.S. Open. The injury forced Luke out for the rest of the year, and some said it was possibly even career-threatening. Luckily, it was not, and Luke was able to return to solid form in 2009, where he made his first FedEx Cup Tour Championship. Just to review to this point, Luke was always sort of known as a plotter in the game, who was consistent and had a solid short game, but nothing really more than that. Well, starting in 2010, he really started to build momentum and turn all parts of his game up a notch. In 2010, he had a great season of consistency on both tours. On the European Tour, he got his third win there, and while on the PGA Tour he didn't win, 
he did rack up a number of high finishes, including two thirds and three seconds. Overall, he finished third in the FedEx Cup that season, and again he played a big role in Team Europe's victory at the Ryder Cup with his 3, 1, and 0 record. In 2011, he had the season we all remember him for. Early that year, he picked up his biggest win at the WGC Accenture Match Play Championship, where he beat the newly crowned number one Martin Keimer in the finals. He came up just short a few weeks later at the Heritage, where he lost in a playoff to Brand Snedeker, but with that finish though, he became number one in the world rankings and continued to roll on. Soon thereafter, he won the premier event on the European Tour, the BMW PGA Championship, where in a playoff he defeated another recent number one in Lee Westwood. A few weeks later, he picked up another win on the European Tour at the Barclays Scottish Open. Going to the last tournament of the PGA Tour year, even though he had finished third again in the FedEx Cup that season, he still had a chance to win the money title with a win. And coming up clutch, Luke did just that. He picked up his fourth PGA Tour win at the Children's Miracle Network Hospitals Classic and claimed the PGA Tour money title. With more good play even later in that year, he ended up taking home the money title on the European Tour as well. This made him the first player to ever top the money list on both the PGA Tour and European Tour in the same year. In addition to all this, he racked up all the major awards from both tours that year. I'm talking player of the year and scoring titles. Other than not getting a major championship that season, this certainly was a dreamy year for Luke, where not only he played great and won, he was also beating his closest rivals. From there in 2012, he continued his splendid play. Early that year, he captured his fifth PGA Tour win at the Transitions Championship, and again at the BMW PGA Championship in Europe, Luke defended his title. He also once again helped Team Europe make a comeback at that year's Ryder Cup with his two, two, and zero record. So obviously things were going great, and Luke seemed to have reached his prime. The only thing missing was a major championship. He had plenty of top 10s and majors by this time, but he hadn't quite been in a position to really close one out near the end. Thus, in 2013, he sought to change that. After more good play to begin the season, the US Open came around and Luke was one of the favorites. And he played like it too. Through three rounds, he played nicely and found himself two shots back from the lead. Unfortunately, it wasn't Luke who began the first Englishman to win the US Open since Tony Jacklin in 1970. It was Luke's good friend, Justin Rose. This seemed to be a turning point for Luke, and I'll talk about why I think this in a bit. But after his struggle that final round, Luke's consistency really has not been the same. He defended his title at the Dunlop Phoenix Tournament in Japan later in the year, but other than that, 2013 was the last time he won worldwide. From 2014 to early 2017, he didn't play bad, but it just wasn't the same. He contended a few times here and there, but like I said, he didn't have any victories, and he also failed to make the European team for the Ryder Cup in 2014 and 2016. In 2017, things start to really take a turn for the worst, as after finishing second in the RBC Heritage, he missed the next eight cuts. Late in that year, he had a scare at the RSM Classic, where he withdrew because he was experiencing chest pains. Fortunately, Luke was okay, and was later released from the hospital with nothing serious. As he recovered though, he slipped outside the top 100 in the world rankings for the first time since 2002. Coming back to play in early 2018, he had very inconsistent results as he missed more cuts than he made. And in April of that year, Luke decided to take the rest of the year off in order to heal the herniated disc in his back, which he said he had been playing through in the past months. Letting his back heal, Luke returned in 2019 and was granted a major medical exemption for 15 stars to try to earn his card back. While he showed promise in some events, he didn't find enough consistency to keep his card. In 2020, it's been more of the same, as Luke is now relying on a career earnings exemption. So far though, he has not found any momentum in his game to this point, and as of this video, he ranks 418th in the world rankings. Which brings us to the big question, what happened to Luke Donald? Well, let's overanalyze, shall we? In the last few years, we can obviously chalk it up to injuries. 
In any sport, it's always tough to find your rhythm in game after coming back from injuries. So as far as that goes, Luke deserves a pass since 2017. I think what we really should be looking at is exactly what led to his major back injury. Because I think it also had to do with what I was referring to earlier regarding his drop off since the 2013 US Open. So to me, it first started when Luke saw his good friend Justin Rose win that US Open. This might be an unpopular thought, but I think after seeing that, Luke got a little disheartened that his fellow peer won a major in front of him. Which is natural, they are friends and I'm sure he was happy for Justin like anyone would be for a friend. But with that also comes a competitive fire, like, man, I missed a great chance there, that could have been me who won. To back up my theory, I point to Luke's actions later in 2013. So after another disappointing finish at a major in that year's Open Championship, where he missed the cut there, Luke decided to make some big changes. So for the longest time, Luke worked primarily with his college coach, Pat Goss, through his pro career. He even brought on Dave Alred in 2010, which obviously brought great results as he reached his peak in 2011. Well, in 2013, after that Open Championship, he went away from both of them. And some of you are going to love this, he decided to go and change his swing and do it with Chuck Cook. He originally wanted to do the swing change with Sean Foley, but Sean had a full plate at the time, so he recommended his mentor Chuck Cook to Luke. From there, Luke sought to not necessarily find more distance, but more consistency with his ball striking. He wanted more opportunities to come down the stretch of majors and have the ability to hit flush rockets on demand. Basically, he wanted to do what Justin Rose did in his US Open win. However, this swing change clearly did not bring the results that Luke wanted. And I'll even take it a step further and say that part of the reason he started getting major back injuries was because of this swing change. While he did eventually go back to his old coach and Pat Goss, those habits he built under Chuck Cook were too deep-seated. The changes made to his swing were simply too unnatural for Luke, and as we saw with Tiger and his Sean Foley swing, when you do something that doesn't fit with your natural fundamentals, you begin to experience injuries. This was a classic case where it's that fine line and slippery slope that we see many golfers dance on. You want to get better, but at the cost of possibly getting worse. And look, Luke is aware of it too. He often points out that he understands people questioning him for changing the swing that got him to number one. To quote him directly, he said, quote, I would have felt worse if I hadn't tried it. Not many guys have changed their swing radically and been successful. Tiger showed it can be done, but it's very hard. There are countless examples of people who have tried and had it not work. So clearly, Luke knew what he was getting into, and he doesn't regret at least going for the change. Which is cool, I feel where he's coming from, but we do have to say that it was a mistake to change his swing. Yes, hindsight is 2020, but he probably should have just grinded it out with his original swing and trusted that his wonderful short game along with his wedge play would have eventually got him that major. With his old swing, I don't know if he would have eventually got his major, and I don't know if he would have still gotten that severe back injury. But what I do know is that it got him to number one in the world. And at the very least, I do believe Luke has a game to be contending with his fellow peers who are still competing at a high level, like Justin Rose, Paul Casey, and Ian Poulter. So that's just my thoughts on what I think happened to Luke Donald. At the end of the day, I wish him all the best going forward with his game in life. He still has had a hell of a career to this point like all the players I've talked about in my other videos. And I know he's playing this fall in some events, so we'll see if he can find his old form again. I'll be ruined for him. I know I also didn't talk too much about his personal life like I did with my other videos, but from what I've seen and heard about Luke, he seems like a nice classy guy. And he does seem to be living happily with his beautiful family, so that definitely counts for something. But yeah, let me know what y'all think. What do you think happened to Luke Donald? As always, I appreciate y'all for watching. Please like, subscribe, and comment below. Your words mean something to me.